heard about the club. The club last year celebrated its 150th anniversary. So this is the oldest press club in the United States. And we have some, you know, great traditions. So, you know, the club started out kind of, you know, kind of sketchy as a place for reporters to, um, you know, gather, drink whiskey and play cards. And over the years, you know, it grew and had a reputation of a, of a, of a place where more reporters could come and drink whiskey and play cards. And so we're proud to have uh, a very colorful reputation, but we also have a reputation as a place for thoughtful, civil, civic discussions such as this one. So tonight, if you would just please be respectful in your comments and questions, and remember that it's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be disagreeable. Uh, and a quick word about the, um, the bathrooms. Uh, unfortunately, we had some rain that uh, caused a leak in our bathrooms up here on this floor. And um, we don't want to open those bathrooms at this stage. They're out, of, they're out of order. So if you need to make your way to the restroom, the bathrooms in the basement are the place to go. Um, also, we'd like to pass around a uh, sign-up sheet. Who's got a pen? If you would kindly maybe give us your name and email address, and if you have a business card, and if you'd like to bring it up here to the table, we would like to hold a drawing for a free membership to the Denver Press Club. I can't recommend it strongly enough. Anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Ann MC, uh, who is a uh, former correspondent uh, for the Associated Press in Moscow, and as I call her, the creme de la Kremlin. <laughs> and she's going to get things started tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate you joining us here at the Denver Press Club. And uh, we're passing around the sign-up sheet, as Tim mentioned. We'd love to get your information. Um, and also let you know that the club is open to the pub membership by the public. You don't have to be a journalist. You just need to support the mission, which is to support quality and ethical journalism. So if you're interested, just let anybody uh, in charge know. Um, so my background is that I was an Associated Press correspondent in Moscow for the collapse of the Soviet Union from 88 through 91. Uh, I got there just as things were starting to reform, and I left after the collapse of the country and the Communist Party. And then I worked for the Rocky Mountain News for 14 years, started a news nonprofit, and um, have freelanced along the way for lots of different organizations. I've also written a book on the ending of the Soviet Union uh, with CNN, and I've uh, been back and forth many times to train Russian journalists and uh, do freelance reporting and reporting for the Rocky Mountain News. Um, I will start by introducing our panelists. Uh, we have three here in the room, and Lev Parkomenko uh, is joining us from Moscow by Google Hangout, I believe. Um, We'll start with, on the left, uh, Anastasia Bolton was born in Moscow, came to the United States for college after living in various countries as the daughter of a diplomat. After graduation from Southern Methodist University, she began work in television news, and she's been with Nine News here in Denver since uh, 12 years ago. She's also received a, a National Edward R. Murrow Award for, uh, with one of her colleagues for a story on a woman who survived a killer. That's one of the top broadcast journalism awards in the country and has won a regional enemy. So thank you for coming, Anastasia. She also said, oh, she also handled the pre-Olympics coverage in Sochi, Russia for the entire Gannett uh, news chain and uh, managed to parlay this, I'm very impressed, into stories in Moscow and a thousand mile driving trip from Moscow to Sochi uh, while she was on that trip and has traveled to Siberia for a story on Russian orphans. Jonathan Edelman, in the middle, has earned his PhD at Columbia University and has spent his career at the University of Denver, specializing in the Soviet Union, now Russia, and the Middle East. He was Condoleezza Rice's dissertation advisor. He has lectured and been a visiting professor all over the world and has written 12 books, including one about Soviet foreign policy many years ago with Deborah Palmieri, our next panelist. Um, Deborah is the honorary consul for Russia in Denver 
which means she res represents Russian interests, but she's not a diplomat, and she does not speak for De Vladimir Putin, she emphasizes. She <laughs> speaks only for herself. She's an American who grew up in Denver, earned a PhD from Columbia in International Relations, uh, and with specialty in political economy, uh, politics, and Soviet foreign policy. She encourages trade between Russia and the United States, both as a private consultant and as the honorary consul. And Lev, hello Lev, can you hear us okay? Yes, Great. I am good to hear you. Nice to see you again. Uh, Lev Parkhomenko is joining us from Moscow where he is an economics reporter for TV Dozhd, which means TV rain. Dozhd is an independent television news operation that reached more than a million viewers before it was pulled off cable in 2014 by the government, and has since then has continued online. Uh, Lev has a weekly show discussing economics, and recently has also begun working for a competitor to Uber, I believe, called Get. Uh, so he's learning to be an entrepreneur and uh, middle class business person. And in the summer of 2016, he worked with Nine News here in Denver on a fellowship through the International Center for Journalists. So I wanted to get started with a few questions for the panel, uh, and then we'll open it up to everyone in the room. I want to ask the panel and people asking questions to use a microphone because we are recording this um, for use on the internet. So um, you aren't just talking to people in the room, uh, you might be talking to others around the world. So we'll just start with the basic question we, we came up with for the, for the panel, which is, what does Russia want? Uh, what, with all the things that are going on, that we have so many issues between Russia and the West these days, what is it Russia's lock looking for? And then maybe follow up with, is the United States willing to provide it? Uh, Anastasia, you want to start? I always look to the next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jonathan, why don't you start? Well, I think Vladimir Putin has, I think. Is it, I think it's on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. It's on. Just, it's on. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so I think from Vladimir Putin's perspective, the world has been very good to him until now, but he's going, he's in his 60s, he now has six more years, and he's trying to figure out how he can take advantage of the problems, of the problems in the West. And those that particularly are very useful for him. Number one is the Middle East. He has to decide, now that they're winning the war that nobody thought they could possibly win in Syria, together with Bashar al-Assad and the Turks and also the Iranians, he has to decide where next is he going to go. And that's a very difficult choice because historically, Russia, going back to Tsarist Russia, which he often goes back to, has been antithetical to both the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, and to the Persian Empire. And in fact, if you go back four years ago, when Russia decided not to sell the S for the S-400 missile, anti-missile missile, to the Iranians, and the Iranians were very upset at that time, since been taken care of. But what happened was, the, after the Iranians had blasted uh, Putin and Russia on the front pages of their other magazines and newspapers, he responded with an equal blast, pointing out that we'd like to remind our Iranian friends of the history of the last 200 years. Now, the majority of Americans don't know what he was talking about, but the Iranians do, because there were four wars between Iran and the Persian Empire and Tsarist Empire and then the Soviet Union, all of which were won by the Russians. And so he's got to make that is an important issue. He's got to try to do something that most Americans have found extremely difficult. Who is President of the United States? Whether you like him or dislike him, he's not easy to typecast and to figure out what kind of long-term policy you're going to have to deal with somebody who can one week, you know, laud Vladimir Putin for you know, having won the election, and then the next week announced that he's pulling 70, 60 members of the Russian you know, elite out of Washington and New York. So I think from his point of view, he's trying to think, who's he going to believe? And basically, Sergei Lavrov, whom I had the pleasure of meeting once in Moscow, is absolutely brilliant. He doesn't smile. 
but he is like a computer, and he's always calculating what is good. And you can see that, and I'll just wind up on that point, you can see that in the way that Putin has acted with regards to southern Ossetia, Abkhazia, to Crimea, and to parts of western Ukraine. To move very carefully, to move very slowly, and to make sure that the West is going to give this victory to the Russians, but is not going to intervene to stop it. So he's got to decide now with a new American president who is unclear and even unclear if you listen to him, which he's going to do, he's still got to decide what his last glorious years are going to look like. To me, I think it's very clear what the Russians want. And the number one thing that Russians want is respect for the sovereignty of their country. If you were to talk to any Russian and, and ask them the same question, they want respect and they want uh, to be respected as an independent country. They do not want interference from this country or anyone else in their domestic affairs. Uh, they do not want to be subject to regime change actions. And they also want recognition of Russia's interests and that Russia has legitimate interests. Uh, for example, no missiles um, or tanks or troops on their border. We would not expect to have troops and tanks and missiles on our border, and they expect the same thing, and they feel that there is not a respect for the recognition of Russian interests. Um, I think uh, they certainly also want to normalize the bilateral relationship between the United States and Russia. They're very disappointed to see this deterioration. And from their perspective, they feel that a lot of accusations have been made against them without evidence and proof um, of these allegations. And the script poisoning is an example of that. And I would call your attention to an unprecedented um, press conference that was held by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in which they summoned all of the ambassadors in Moscow to the ministry uh, to deliver a two-hour presentation on the scriptal issue and to state why they are innocent of these charges. And if you haven't seen if you haven't seen that, that is on the internet. But um, uh, they feel that these are unfair charges that have been made against them, amongst other charges, such as meddling in the US election and so on. And uh, they, want, they want fairness and they want a fair play. Uh, in, a, in a broader sense, they would like to see the removal of sanctions and the normalization of business and trading relationship. So I'll stop there. If I can go last, because I have actually rebuttals to both of those, but I think Lev living there and, and dealing with um, um, living in the culture and, and being a reporter there and journalist, maybe he has a maybe something else to add that I could piggyback off of. So Lev, Lev what does Russia Lev. want? Can you, Lev, can you hear us? I think we froze. <laughs> lost the connection. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, can you hear us now? And then you hear, you hear so, me. So, I punted. To, sorry, I'm not the moderator. I need to stop okay, talking. You, you go ahead. Um, Lev, so what does Russia want? Well, uh, yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for the, for this invitation, and it's a great pleasure to to talk with you. And I beg your pardon that maybe I can uh, I can't speak too loud because I don't want to wake up my family. You know, because it's 3 a.m. in Moscow now. <laughs> So, um, literally, well, I want maybe to agree with, uh, with the previous speakers about respect, but in some other way, because if we, if we uh, listen the, to the official position of uh, Russian authorities, of, 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 uh, position of Putin, uh, um, especially if you take the last, last interview uh, to Megan Kelly from the ABC News, uh, which was great, by the way. Um, you can hear that almost on every question, uh, the, the answer from Putin is that, okay, let's sit on the table, let's sit around the table, let's talk about, let's talk about this, uh, let's discuss this this issue, uh, no matter what's North North Korea, Syria, or election elections, or, or whatever. Uh, 
So uh, the only thing, the, the only thing that Putin wants to to tell to the world that we, we that he wants to be part of the global process. Uh, he wants to be a part of global decisions. Uh, maybe he wants to, to to be there only with the United States, as it was you know, in Soviet era when only two countries decided all the all the things around the world and uh literally putin putin said it every every time uh, about soviet era that uh he's very upset about Um, so in order, in order to prepare for this panel, I um, did the journalism thing. I just interviewed a few few people. Oh, there he is. Oh, and he's back. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, yes, and, and I hear you. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, sure. So uh, I don't know where, where, where the connection was was lost. You were saying that at every point, at every point Putin says something and he wants, and that's when it broke and the люди здесь сказали, ой, и всем очень хочется от вас слышать. То что, короче, что хочет Путин? Okay, yeah. So uh, that's the well, that's the the, the official uh, point of view and the the official position of, of Russian Russian authorities of Russian government, but at the same time. Um, you really need to understand that uh, almost everything what you see from Russia, every, every word, every statement, every I don't know animation of new nuclear power, of new nuclear weapon, or something like this, uh, at least half of it is not for for you, or is not for you know any anybody outside of of, of the country, but. Uh, it is for for, for Russian uh, audience. It's it is for inner audience, uh, especially uh, during last month before the presidential election. So because it's almost the same as in as in the United States, where. where uh, Um, so until we get left back. So what I was saying is when I um, was invited to speak at this panel, I thought, well, I don't live in Russia anymore. Um, and so I should talk to people who do and figure out what they believe. So obviously I have family and I have friends. And so I've just talked to them about um, what it is that we wanted to discuss on this panel. And I think the chief answer to what Russia want based on the people who to told me about it is, Russia wants respect and what Russia wants to be viewed as a superpower. And if you think about it, that answer really makes sense because why on earth, why else would it go to, why else would Russia go to Syria? Like why would it get involved in a conflict that really has nothing to do with Russia? Um, why would it take over Crimea? And you know, and it, it, it's an occupation. I don't think there's a debate about that, right? Um, so there has been nostalgia for what the Soviet Union used to mean, what the Soviet Union used to be, and how the Soviet Union used to rank uh, in the world. And I remember this because I was growing up during that time. I left when, in 1995. So right after the second coup and at the height of you know perestroika and when Yeltsin came to power. So I watched the country unravel and the nostalgia for it. And that nostalgia never sort of left. Um, and if you talk to people from there, they may not want to live there again, but they still feel in a certain way that you know they came from a great country that, that, that fell apart. I mean, my stepfather, who worked for their version of the State Department for 15 years and then it fell apart, he was really angry about that. Um, so it wants to be a force to be reckoned with. Now, 
more specifically, what does it want? It wants the lifting of, of, of the sanctions. And some of the sanctions, I don't know if you're f familiar with the Magnitsky Act. Um, he was, well, some say he was murdered. Uh, but these are financial sanctions. And a lot of the Russians, where do you keep your money? You keep your money, you, you some say you steal the money, right? Because nobody can make billions of dollars. And you put it overseas. You buy things overseas. You buy things in the UK. You buy things in the United States. You buy, you have offshore accounts. Where else are you gonna put all of these billions of dollars that you have access to? So obviously there are concerns about the sanctions and the, be, your money that you put somewhere else being accessible to you. So that's what um, it's been told to me. That's what Russia really wanted going into this election. I mean, it was evident that Clinton was not gonna do it, but Russia sort of had a shot with Trump. Maybe he would lift them. Maybe he would give us access to some of the money. I mean, we can talk about who's guilty or not guilty of the poisoning in London. Um, let's say Russia is guilty. You know, some people say that it's been proven. I asked, um, I asked somebody about that. I'm like, why would you, if you wanted the lifting of the sanctions, right, if you want to calm the ship and you want the access to your money and the property that has been seized by the US government in some places, why would you do, hypothetically, such a public murder? Could you not have killed him any other way? I mean, really, right? Isn't that a logical question? But um, again, as it is explained to me, if Russia did it, it's just a show of uh, force. Look at what you can do. And again, that's not my opinion. Um, that is just an opinion that has been shared by some folks who are better versed in the internal politics than myself. Hopefully that answers the question. We got Lev back. Great. Lev, did you want to try to finish? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, I just want to add about this. Uh, uh, Oh. Pretty, pretty agree about that because because really, if if we look on the on the results of this scandal about scruples, scruple poisoning and and the uh, and the, all the uh, di um, diplomats deportings, uh, etc. Uh, if if we think about G, it's really have an advantage advantage from that because. Uh, really, there is a huge economical crisis here in Russia for the last many, for like three or four years, and uh, there is really lack of money and lack of investments. It's uh, well, foreign investments is um, is is minimum for last years, and uh, what we see as a result of of, of the scandal is that um, Russian Russian people who are living abroad or who are keeping their money abroad, they're afraid that their assets will and the only, the only way to, uh, for, to save the, uh, those money for them is to move it back to Russia. And we already saw it uh, just days before the last uh, so-called sanction list was, was um, uh, published the, by Trump administration, like in, in beginning of February, uh, when nobody know, knows who will be in this in this list and what will be the what will be the um, sanctions against those people, uh, we saw uh, how like about 10, 10 billion of dollars uh, was uh, t um, was moved to Russian accounts in Russian banks just two or, or one week before the announcement. Um, and between, between you know, well, Russian people, and, uh, officials uh, who live uh, outside of the country. And after that, just weeks after the, uh, after the, this list was published and everybody understood that it's almost fake, you know, that, 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 that this list doesn't mean anything that those people who is this who is uh, is in this list uh, they have no risks you know 
all that money was moved back to the Ebro, back to the United States and offshore accounts. And it was like, you know, very fast. But we saw how it works, really. And in this, in this way, we understand that this isolation, which is rising day by day uh, around Russia, uh, is, uh, is very bad for the country, is very bad for, for Russian people, is very bad for Russian economy. But at the same time, it's really a good, good thing for the Putin's regime. And we see uh, how uh, UK is starting to, uh, to put some pressure on Russian assets. Well, at least they're speaking about that, about, about some investigations, about Russian investments, about Russian money in UK, uh, that, they, that they want some, um, you know, some details about the origins of those money. And, well, we'll see how it will end, but looks like that this is the, 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 the very same thing what Putin wants from this situation. So, Lev, are you saying that so many Russians have money abroad that just the threat of sanctions is really bad for ordinary Russians, not just the people getting sanctioned? Just, the, sorry, can you repeat? Just the threat, what? The, is the threat of sanctions really bad for ordinary Russians because they're afraid it will affect them even if it doesn't actually directly affect them? It, it's the fear that causes them to move money and to be fearful that yeah, they'll absolutely. lose access absolutely. to your money. Absolutely, because, well, if you have an account in, I don't know, in some Swiss bank and, and you understand that maybe next day it will be arrested and you will not be able to, to use it, so, and the only, so the only way to save it is just to move it back to Russia, because it's, this is the only, you know, safe, safe haven for, for those money. Uh, that's, well, that's completely understandable logic, but, but uh, that, that means, but... As we see how it how it moved back to Russia and then back to to, to Europe, uh, um, in the um, uh, list publication from the Trump administration, we saw how fast it could be and how how um, again fake it is because uh, you know yes everybody in Russia wants that Russian money will go back to go will go back to Russia so that it will uh, well. Give some, give some um, advantages to Russia economy. That uh, those money will be invested to the Russia economy, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. But as as we as we saw, it was it was just moved here and back. So that means that uh, the very next day after the sanction will will lift will be lift. The, those money will be run back to the Europe or to the Western countries again. So they will not work for the. Uh, those money will not work for the Russian economy. Okay. Um, maybe, Jonathan, you want to tackle this one? So if Russia wants international respect and to be treated as a superpower, is the United States willing to do that? Well, the $64,000 question, of course, is always, what is Donald Trump going to do in the next two hours um, and the next day? So, and we've seen the continual changeover. Now we see John Bolton. Um, we see the changeover of the head of the CIA also is now um, going to be given the job of Rex Tillerson. So I think that's number one. The Russians are not unique in trying to understand what is American foreign policy. And that doesn't mean it's good or it's bad. It's that even if it's bad, they want to know what they're dealing with. So I think that's a significant problem. Um, and the Russians also were dealing with other problems at the same time. There was a recent poll that was taken in Russia, and it found that 25% of Russians want to emigrate, want to leave the country. And so when you go back and think about the 300 million people there were at the time of the Soviet Union, now we're down to 143 million. And yes, the birth rate is up a little bit, but still it's below the level it needs to be. So it continues to shrink. So for somebody like Vladimir Putin, so a lot of these things are very difficult to deal with. He can't really influence American foreign policy that much. And he's probably wondering why the Americans are acting this particular way. He might have the idea, but who knows if he does, but he might have the idea that perhaps it was because he has been re accused repeatedly of colluding with the Russians that now he needs to be severe towards the Russians so that he can get ready and put away 
the whole issue about whether or not he's going to be impeached. Does anybody else want to tackle that, or should we move on to the next question? Okay. So let's then distinguish what do Russians want as opposed to what Russia as the government and, and the foreign policy wants. Um, is it something different? Well, I'll try. Okay. <clears throat> so I think just like, you know, just like in any country, uh, there is a segment of the population that doesn't care about politics and does not get involved and doesn't pay attention. Um, I think there are a, a large percentage of young people who don't watch television, which is state-owned, 99% of it, except for who Lev works for. And so they don't get the propaganda, the constant feeding of the narrative um, that Russia is great or whatever, whatever the narrative is. And so the young people take... Um, the news from the internet and you know social media and things like that. So they, some of them, you've seen them on you know different big squares in Russia mobilizing and stepping up and saying we don't want this, um, and they were promptly squashed. Um, but I think is the way, the way that it was explained to me right. It was that if 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 you are a person who watches television and your only option is what the television shows you, then you start believing and repeating what the television says. It is not dissimilar to what we have in this country, right? If you watch only one channel, then you're going to believe one thing. If you don't uh, sort of um, consume different forms of media to become better educated. So if you only have one option and say you don't have a computer or you don't have access to the internet or you make $100 a month, you are not going to necessarily care about the politics, right? If you're caring about more what, what how you're going to buy food for the month or how you're going to pay utilities. Um, or you're going to repeat what the television says to you. And the television during Obama years, as has been told to me, right, I'm not a consumer of this television, um, that it was, you know, Obama was responsible for everything. The joke is, you know, similar to this, thanks Obama. Now, um, the narrative, I'm told, is similar. You know, they're blaming Trump for whatever. So it varies vastly what the Russian people want, right? The Russian people who have a lot of money probably want to be able to keep their money and want to be able to stay in power for as long as it's possible. People who don't have the money, if they care about politics, maybe they care about their family more than they care about the politics of the country, right? And maybe a lot, a large portion of the population cares about Mr. Putin and the narrative that this is our our country is great and we're going to blame the United States for everything. Um, so probably a large percentage of, of of folks in Russia feel that way. They believe what the television screen says to them, what the papers print, and they don't go any further. So that's where we're at. I was recently in Russia last May, and I've been talking to Russians probably for about 40 years now. And there are wonderful people, and there are warm people. Um, there are very smart people. And I think they want what everybody wants. They want a normal life. They want to be able to work. They want to be able to raise families. Uh, they want to be able to travel. Uh, they want to be able to have respect um, from other countries. I think um, they also don't want to feel that they are under siege. And in talking to Russians most recently, um, how can you help but not be influenced when you hear a steady drumbeat that you are involved in uh, all sorts of hacking and interference and that your government was involved in poisonings and that sort of thing, all of which are officially denied. And so that has an effect on dampening the friendship between the American and the Russian peoples. It can't help but do that. Um, I think Russians want to live in peace. And it took me a long time to really understand the meaning of that, because I first went over to the Soviet Union in 1980. And I thought it was just more of a propaganda statement. You know, we want peace, world peace. But then I understood that they lost 28 million people in the Second World War, that they basically won the war for the West. Because how many people did we, leave, we, did we lose in that war? We lost 400,000, which was a terrible toll for us in America. And they lost 28 million people. 
And some uh, uh, academics that we've spoken with most recently in Moscow think that number could be higher. And so they don't understand this animosity that the West, many in the West, feel towards them, and certainly now the American government. They want peace. They do not want war. So I think um, if, if I had to summarize what, what do the Russian people want, they want to live in peace. They want to live normal lives. They want to enjoy their children and their grandchildren. The young people want to take advantage of all the technology that everyone else does. They create a lot of that technology, uh, but they absolutely do not want war. I might add to that. Um, I had a friend call me from Russia in, I think around January and say, say, what can you tell me about the war? And I said, what war? I'm thinking, does she mean Syria? Does she mean Ukraine? What? And she said, the United States is going to attack Russia. And I said, what? <laughs> what makes you think that? And she said, well, everybody's talking about it because there had been a whole series of announcements that dealt with this, even to the extent of the mayor of St. Petersburg saying what the ration was going to be after the United States invaded. And I finally tracked down some articles about this and discovered that somebody had figured out that this was basically being done by individuals with a particular axe to grind or a particular political thing they were trying to achieve. Um, but apparently I'd reached quite a few people and scared them with the idea that the United States actually was seriously considering invading Russia. And I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks that that's likely. Um, anyway, um, so let's go on. Um, Dan is trying to come up with a different way to communicate with Lev so that we can talk to Lev. And do you have it, or should I go on? Nope. Um, the, what's one key thing that you would like to tell Americans about Russia um, that you think they don't understand? Lev's back. Oh, Lev. Yeah, All right. Yes. yes. It's great. Hi, Lev. Yeah. <laughs> Hey. Okay, so if we if we have continue to have trouble keeping it, we'll try doing just audio. Okay. Okay, sure. Okay, and if you if if it's okay, maybe me too should 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 the should turn off the the video. It looks good now. Yeah. Ah, okay, great. Okay, okay so let's try. We were just talking about um, what do Russians want as opposed to what their government wants. What do when it comes to all these things that are happening between the Russia and the West. But what do Russians want? Is it different? Uh, well, again, <laughs> well, what I can say is I agree, is agree with the panelists because uh, Russians are just the same people as any other in the world. They, they want to live in prosperity, they want safety, they want travel, etc., etc. Um, and, uh, well, they the kids, uh, but since it's really hard to achieve and hard to, um, hard, it's really hard to have here in Russia. Um, instead of that, uh, uh, what what Putin's government can can um, propose to the Russian people is the respect, is the is the uh, respect from other countries. Yes, that, that's that's the the the. The change, you know. Okay, you are living bad. You are you are poor. You are uh, you have not enough of I don't know uh, medicine or education or something like that. But instead of that, everybody around the world is is respect you. That that was that what uh, Putin and his government want to uh, propose to Russian people, and uh, and that is what Russian people agree to to have now. Uh, maybe if if uh, somebody ask them what. You, you prefer a better future for, the, for your kids or the fact that everybody around the world scare of you, you know, scare of your weapon or something like that, the answer will, will be pretty understandable. I want something for my family, not about, you know, my historical, uh, well, my, play, my place in history or something like that. Uh, but for now, there is no choice, you know. There is only one thing. That's th this image of of, of superpower uh, w with which everybody counts. 
and we, with everybody you want, you know, um, to talk with maybe or something like that. That's that's mostly about propaganda maybe to, uh, between Russian people, uh, but still it is as it is, and and it's really it's really hard to, hard to change because because it's quite difficult to to, to explain. today in the world. You know, uh, power is not the weapon, it's economy, it's the richness of the people, uh, you know, the, the level of the quality of life in, uh, and many things as, as this, not the nuclear weapon, nuclear warheads, you know, quantity of nu nuclear war warheads or something like that. Um, uh, so, but, so yes. there, would you say yeah. that um, most Russians believe their government's denial that their government has been involved in all these things the West is upset about, like election interference and poisonings and invading Ukraine? And uh, well, um, it's really hard to say, well, how, um, you know, well, when, when you are living in such really bad circumstances, when you almost despair and, and, and hopeless, in your life is the TV, where you see the news on every on day-to-day -day basis about how Russia is great, how everybody is scared of Russia, and how you know um, um, how good our army is. You know, and and this is how it how it works. And this and, and I can say that it's it's the invention of Russian propaganda. It's classical classical way how to fool people maybe. And um, yes, and in, in this case, when when you really have no other uh, have no other um, have no other you know chances to change your life. Uh, that's the only thing that you can. That uh, that will make your life maybe a little bit better, you know, to understand that okay, really, I'm in the, I'm in a bad situation, but at least uh, uh, every but so let's move on to um, maybe Deborah can tackle this one first. The uh, what is it that you'd like to tell Americans about Russia that they don't understand? Well, Americans, as we, we're very good at a lot of things, but geography is one of those things where we just just somehow miss the boat because it's natural. We're, we're an insular country. We are surrounded by oceans. And so we don't know geography as good as we should know it. And um, I certainly would want Americans to understand that Russia is the largest country in the world. It is twice the size of the United States. And most Americans don't realize that. Um, they don't realize that Russia is formidable. Russia is, is not an economy in tatters. Uh, Russia is not, um, as, as um, our former president once said, and as another famous senator said, Russia is a country masquerading as a gas station. Uh, these are not accurate depictions of what Russia is. Russia is a very sophisticated um, country. Uh, these are some of the most brilliant, literate people in the world who study science and math and physics and are some of the best um, uh, scientists and technologists that you'll find. Russians, for example, uh, the RD-180 rocket engine launches 50% of our, um, our commercial and our military satellites. Russia is the largest wheat exporter in the world, and this is all non-GMO wheat. They've surpassed the US in wheat production. Um, they're the largest producer of natural oil and gas. And so they're formidable. They're not a weak country. 
And so I think when a lot of Americans look at Russia, they don't really understand that even despite the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, that you're still dealing with a very formidable country who uh, has in its within its boundaries some of the greatest natural resources in the entire world, including most of the strategic minerals that we rely on. Well, I think I, I, I agree with the significant part of what Deborah just said. And I think what's important is that if we are going to be able to get along with other countries, we do have to come out of the, pro, of the, of the difficulties that we have in understanding other countries. Um, and not just understanding Russia today, but we have trouble understanding what may be happening in Britain with Jeremy Corbyn, you know, very strong, you know, talking about fascism and talking about anti-Semitism. We can look at Hungary, where I've spent a fair amount of time, and despite what happened in, in 1849 and 1956, the Hungarians are really supporting a kind of right-wing movement, um, which you also see um, very much in, in countries like Romania, um, and, and Bulgaria. So I think it's important for Americans to try to understand something that is incredibly difficult, which is that for Americans, the last time we were invaded in this country by foreigners, you know, or even other people that we regarded as foreigners was in 1814. So it's very hard to understand the Russian perspective, and not just on the massive losses that they suffered in World War II, but also the fact that other things that they launched after World War II, whether it was um, the whole blockade of Berlin, which was a disaster, whether it was Afghanistan, which was another disaster, um, whether it was Cuban Missile Crisis, which also was a semi-disaster, and therefore we need to un Oh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was not a victory for them at all. Um, but therefore, it's important for us to try to think about other countries. And we have problems. And Deborah's right about that. Because in this country, there is very little knowledge of foreign affairs. The numbers of people who have gone abroad, the majority of American people have not been abroad, unless you're talking about the Bahamas and Mexico and you know pleasure-seeking places. But very few have gone to places like Russia. And I think that would really help to participate in understanding wh who they are and what we may be able to do with them and what we just literally can't do. I would like again to be the last person to answer the question, please. Lev, what would you say yeah. is something you want Americans to understand about Russia? Uh, well, first of all, that, that, uh, that Americans should, sh should not trying to understand Russia through Putin's world, words, maybe through official position that, that uh, you know, real life and, and this uh, official position could be very different in, uh, in many, many, in many topics and many subjects. Uh, this, first of all. Second is that, um, um, well, um, really it's, I, I should I should agree, but the the level of level of you know of uh, knowledge about about um, contemporary Russia and how it's how things going on here because between American politics between American uh, experts between between American analysts because because uh, we we sometimes when we when we see some decisions from from American administration, from uh, you know American, I don't know, um, uh, members of, of Congress or something like that, well, we uh, we understand that very very fast that that sometimes people who takes those decisions they don't really understand what go, what is going on here, uh, or don't understand at all. You know, uh, again, if we're going back to this. To this sanction li last sanction list, which was published in the beginning of February, I don't know if you know about that, but here in Russia we call it telephone book. You know, telephone book, because because here in Russia it looks like somebody just take a telephone book, see the, the all the names from the A to Z, and put it into the list without any understanding who are those people, who are, for what they're responsible. 
uh, which what ties do we ha do they have with Putin's regime? Are they close or not? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, you know. Um, for example, you know the one of the uh, one of the one guy who 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 one of, well who is in this list he is the founder of Yandex, uh, which is the biggest internet company. Well, it will be the same as if we put some sanctions some sanctions on Sergey Brin or or Larry Page because uh, he have some ties with Trump. Crazy. Uh, so you really. Uh, if we're talking about well administration, they really, they really need more expertise about Russia. I, I don't, it, I, and I'm not talking only about Trump's administration. It was quite the same with, with uh, Obama administration and with Bush administration. Really, for the last years, it's a big problem here. And well, the the last is that um, um, really. Even uh, even if I'm completely completely not uh, agree with Putin in all the in many many questions, but I have to agree that really we need to talk about many issues around the world and and really uh, um, there is so many so many things that, that which is which really very hard to solve without Russia and we need to cut up. But you know how we think about each other and and how we think about our national interests, etc. Uh, so I just hope that someday the well the common common sense will will rise up <laughs> between us and and we will start to talk to each other. Anastasia, you want to wrap up? Common sense, <laughs> please. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. No, this is a good try. Love has is optimism. Okay, next president, okay. It's a 3 a.m. optimism. It's okay. You're forgiven. Um, so I think the, the basic, I'm, I'm going to start up here. I'm going to start on the positive, right? I think overall Russians are just the same as Americans, right? We've talked about it before. They want happiness and prosperity for their families. They want their children not to burn up in a movie theater. Right? When the doors are locked, I don't know if everybody or anybody in the room, okay, you guys are nodding, right? So that's what they would like. They probably also would like somebody to be punished for it. The likelihood of that happening in Russia as it is right now is very minimal. Russians, like I did, I think a big thing about this leading up to the Olympics, they don't smile at you if they don't know you. And Americans make fun of that, you know, they're like gloomy or whatever rude people, right? I'm like, why would they? Why would we smile at you if we don't know you? That's not genuine. That's an American thing, right? I, it's a it's a reflex that I learned in this country, which was funny when I first moved here. But and it's true. And, and I, ca I catch myself doing it now. I'm like, you know, well, whatever. I I've been here for twenty something years, so I've just adopted the uh, the custom of the country that I call home now. But. Um, Russians are genuine. Russians are gen generous. Russia, a Russian will give a shirt off his, his or her back for you. And if they invite you to your house, you damn well eat if they put a food in front of you. That's just a thing, <laughs> right? Um, so there's that. But I think the misconception is I agree with some of the points that you've made in terms of geography and understanding of of, of where it is and what the national interests are. I a little bit disagree in terms of the progressiveness of this country uh, and, and what it does. If you look at who is inventing things and who is producing things and who is doing things, who are the Russian people, they are all overseas, right? How many of them who have been able to leave are leaving and have been leaving for years ever since the border was open? Like, if you could leave and have a way to do it, and, and, and that's my personal bias here, to be honest with you, why would you stay there? I mean, you could stay there for the love of the country. You could stay there because you don't want to come here and you don't want to wash toilets, like a friend of mine told me. She has no future, and she's living there on $5,000 a month, and that is all she's ever going to get. She's not saving any money for retirement because you can't save a ruble because you don't know what it's going to do tomorrow. So... I think, in my experience, the, the talented, the educated, the people with the future have left. And, I'm sorry? Except left. 
Except for Lev. Lev, we need you here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, some people also obviously are patriots and stay, and some people are okay with, with living there. I mean, all things are possible, but you sort of have to really look at what's, what's happening here and really read more about the what Russia has been accused of doing and the consequences and have they suffered any consequences. I think people in general in this country, um, since we can afford to, we have the time because we're not worried about where the groceries are going to come from, most of us, right, in this room at least. We should know what the other people are going through to uh, really understand the cultural differences, the economical differences, and so forth. Okay, so we're going to go to questions from the audience. So, Lev. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sarah. Can you, can you see me? So, um, in response to, to what are the Russian people uh, want us to know, I mean, um, as you said before, with the uh, programming you get in Russia, we get programming here too. So you're not represented on our television. What, are, what is represented really is Putin this and Putin that and Putin this and Putin that. You know, and um, I don't know how we can uh, get that to go up, but something needs to be done media-wise if the um, Russian community wants to be represented over here in our media because what is represented in the picture we get is Putin, 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 right? So Anybody want to answer that? Lev, go ahead. Could you hear that question? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, 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 I hear almost everything except the, the question, so can you repeat it? <laughs> it wasn't really a question, it was just me responding to something you said. Uh, so, okay, um, okay, what, she, what let, let me repeat it for him. Please. Lev, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, she was saying that the Russian people's point of view is not getting heard in the United States because all we hear on our television is what Putin says over and over again. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. <laughs> so, so you mean, you mean how you can, how you, how we can. Can I actually defend other? that for just a second? Mm -hmm. May I? Mm -hmm. Having, working in the media at the moment. Um, yeah. While it's true that we say Putin this and Putin that, which is unlike what we say Trump this and Trump that, we do show, I mean, we as in the media in general, like if you turn on CNN, when there's a pro 